Uh, uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's, it's really funny when companies come to me and say, so when you're calculating customer lifetime value, you know, over what horizon are you calculating it? You know, a year, two years? And I'm saying, don't you understand what the L means? The L stands for lifetime. <laughs> that we're going to project this out basically infinitely far. Because, you know, and especially in a B2B setting, your customer may never die. Uh, and so we want to project this out over a long horizon. I mean, you, you said the word yourself. We don't want to underestimate the value of our customers. By, by Now, I have no problem projecting customer profitability over a year or two or three. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. In many practical settings, that's probably a better place to go than lifetime value. But if we're talking about lifetime value, we're going to do it seriously. And we're going to do it over a very, very long horizon. Yes, we're going to acknowledge the time value of money. Yes, we're going to say that a dollar that we get from you 10 years from now isn't as valuable as a dollar that we get tomorrow. Of course, we're going to account for that. But once we do, then why put a ceiling on it? So that's number one, is, is how far out we go. And number two, when a lot of people say, so what is the model for lifetime value? And my answer, the words I hate to say, but really have to say them is, it depends. Are we talking about a subscription type business? Are we talking about some kind of discretionary purchase where, there, where you know you just kind of do it when you feel like it? Uh, so there's a, a bunch of different business models out there. Uh, and I'm not talking product versus service. I'm talking about things like, is it contractual or non-contractual or some hybrid of the two? Uh, and so we need a separate lifetime value model depending on the nature of the customer relationships. And then third, and I'm going to leave it at that, is uh, uh, too often companies will say, so what is the lifetime value for your customer base? And once again, the answer is it depends. Are we talking about the best customers? Are we talking about the worst ones? So we care just as much about the distribution of the lifetime values mm -hmm. as we care about what is the, the, the average. There is no average customer. Uh, and understanding you know, what that right tail looks like. How many of those beautiful swans do we have? Um, and just how swanful are they? Um, there, there's a, a lot of very, very important insights and financial implications arising from that. Uh, back in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, a, a number of people said, you know, you ought to look at the direct marketing industry. You know, so the, so the folks who back in the in the old days before we had an internet, who would send you catalogs and they'd say, you know, which thing do you want? And they were constantly testing. Uh, you know, today we talk a lot about experimentation and A-B testing. A lot of it was born back then by these firms, as was this concept of customer lifetime value. Yeah. Um, and, and as part of their testing, they were asking exactly that question. What are the factors? What are the features? What are the aspects of the higher value customers? Mm -hmm. So they did what today we'd call a little bit of data mining just to basically say, so what are the things that set those customers apart? And they handed us this amazing gift called RFM, recency, frequency, monetary value. So again, I'm talking about work being done 40, 50 years ago. And they said, the things you wanna look for would be the customers who have bought from you most recently and have bought from you most often over say, I don't know, the last two years. And when they bought, the size of those purchases, recency, frequency, monetary value. And I have to admit that when I first learned about this rubric, I said, oh, that's nice. You know, the, wait in line. There's a million other rubrics out there. What would make this one special? It's not particularly sexy or anything like that. Um, but boy, oh boy, they were right. And it was years later uh, uh, when I, I uh, kind of following up on some of the practices and then developing some of these statistical models and doing all this crazy complicated math that I do and finding that if I did all this math, it collapsed right down to RFM. So I kind of discovered or rediscovered what our forefathers taught us 50 years ago, kind of in a different path. And a light bulb went off and said, my goodness, they're right. It is all about RFM. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, uh, so and then again, it doesn't necessarily apply to every business, but if we're talking about a hotel chain or if we're talking about a, um, a, a retailer, a gaming company, a pharmaceutical company that sells kind of discretionary pharmaceuticals and more for, say, cosmetics and not a chronic ailment, um, then asking those three questions uh, or getting the answers, recency, frequency, monetary value, um, will be the inputs 
that will both distinguish the customers and give us really good predictions about what they're going to be worth in the future. And people hear this and they go, yeah, I get it. And they have the same reaction I did 30 years ago uh, and say, but our business is different. Your business is not different. And RFM is going to apply just as well to you as, as it does to so many others.